Amen. You can be seated. As you're seated, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of Philemon. Philemon is right before Hebrews and after Timothy and Titus. It's a short book, uh, arguably one of the most personal letters that Paul writes in the New Testament. Uh, Typically, when Paul writes a letter, he's addressing a church or churches. We just finished the book of Colossians. It's addressed to the church in Colossae, but it's also to be circulated among the church in Laodicea and Aeropolis. Uh, we, uh, a handful of months ago, uh, visited the, uh, the book entitled Galatians. That was a letter that was written to the churches that were scattered throughout the region of Galatia. It's typical when Paul writes a letter to address the, the churches or the, the church at large with particular truths that are uh, con- uh, important to the Christian and are being confronted by, by culture. And yet, the book of Philemon is a personal letter to a, a man who is in the church of Colossae. Uh, It's a sister letter that accompanies the book of Colossians. So if you're wondering why we're we're studying Philemon, it just seems appropriate as we just finished the book of Colossians to look at the book of Philemon because it's delivered by the same people. And as the book of Colossians is delivered to the church in Colossae, there's a sister letter that's addressing a man named Philemon. And Paul is, is really speaking to two primary issues that emerge throughout the, the entirety of this, this letter, this short letter to the, the man Philem. The, the first kind of category of conversation that's important to note is, is that of equality and identity. The second kind of category of conversation is that of reconciliation and forgiveness. And so this morning we're going to deal with the category and the topic of equality and identity. And next week we'll look at the conversation of reconciliation and forgiveness. And what Paul's doing as one who's mature in the faith is, is he's, he's skillfully applying the gospel in a, a context that is, is profoundly messy. The backstory and a little bit of context of this letter, the backstory is Onesimus was a slave to Philemon the man whom Paul's addressing in this letter. And Onesimus, if we understand the letter, had taken something from Philemon and he had fled to the city, trying to get lost within the city of Rome. Now, there's some pattern here when it comes to behavior. When we do something that's wrong, we tend to flee. We tend to run from anyone that can hold us accountable. And as I shared last week, as 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 Onesimus is trying to get lost in the city, God had other plans for Onesimus, and he was eventually found. We don't know exactly how Paul and Onesimus' life intersected. We we do know that Paul here is is under house arrest in Rome, and we know that Onesimus had done something to Philemon that caused him cost, and he's now in Rome. And so it's likely that potentially both are under the authority of, of the Roman government. But here, Onesimus now in the city of Rome, comes across the ministry of Paul and he hears the gospel and he comes to faith in Jesus. He gets saved. He goes to the city to get lost, running from his, his rebellion and his sin, and, and he, he gets found. He begins to see his, his own need and, and how his needs have been satisfied through Jesus. Now, this, this brings up a, a number of, of, of conversations that I, I think are important uh, for us to consider before we even get into the, the text this morning. And, and, and one of the things that I think is appropriate for us to consider is, is what role does, does a pastor or a mature Christian have in, in influencing society and, and culture? I, I, I've sat with other pastors in the area, and, and we oftentimes talk about the responsibility of a pastor to speak into culture and, and society, and, and, and to what responsibility do we have to speak to everything? And, and we kind of console each other, and we say it kind of feels a little bit like spiritual whack-a-mole. I don't know if you remember going to Pojo's or Chuck E. Cheese as a kid and, and those little moles would pop up and you'd take the, the little soft thing and you'd bat them on the head and then the next one would come up and you'd bat it on the head and you, you, just, you just keep hitting these moles that just seemed to, to never end in, in the things that, that were coming up. And, and at times, pastors can, can be prone to just trying to hit every, everything that pops up. But my prayer for our church, just so you know, is that I don't react 
to culture constantly. Now, there are times where I have to speak to things in the moment because of the ways that it shapes us. But rather, my prayer for our church is that we would think biblically and theologically about our lives, and it would be the lens through which we engage our world so that when those things up, you've already be, been, been armed and equipped with the truth so you know how to rightfully engage those things, discern those things, speak to those things. And Paul here seems to be armed with the gospel, equipped with the gospel in such a way that as a mature Christian, he's, he's not reacting to the, to the social constructs of slavery in the Roman world, but rather through a biblical and theological lens, he's just skillfully applying the gospel in Philemon and Onesimus' life. Onesimus comes to faith with Paul while in prison, and so Paul sends Onesimus back, not just with the letter of the, uh, that, that we read as Colossians, but with a letter that's addressed to Philemon. And, and, and it, it's, it's notable that, that this first conversation of, of equality and identity for some of you, even in language, causes you to squirm, to feel a little bit uncomfortable because of all the training that some of you have done within the workplace around this language of equality. Now, I, I, I want to I wanna be kind of clear and, and appropriate in the way that we address this conversation. And I want you to know that my intention is, is not primarily to become political, but rather theological. And it's appropriate for you to know that politics has in time become more theological than political. And, and politics takes the, the things that are initially theological and biblical and it politicizes them and it, and it divides us in some profound ways and yet it feels obscure, it feels elusive and, and oftentimes it, it actually feels arbitrary. Like what's the, why is it that, that we, we have equality in this world? Why is it that we should respect people from all different socioeconomic backgrounds or different generations or, or different ethnicities? Or why is it that we, we should respect our neighbor regardless of, of their, their uh, political persuasion? Well, because scripture gives us the, the grounds for that. And Philemon gives us a, a context in which Paul is skillfully applying the gospel in that very space, and he does so by pointing us to Philemon's identity as an image bearer of God, as one who's been redeemed by Jesus. It's appropriate, maybe, as we think through Onesimus as a runaway slave, I want you to know that all forms of slavery are wrong. Any diminishment of someone's worth, value, or dignity is wrong. It's an inhumanity. It's dehumanizing someone, and therefore it should be rejected fully and completely. And, and yet, it's, it's probably worth noting that slavery in the ancient world is significantly, was significantly different than, than a modern American history. It was not based on ethnicity. It was not an injustice to a, a, partic a particular ethnic group, but rather there were four kind of primary modes of slavery in the ancient world. First was that of prisoners of war. And so as the Roman Empire would expand into the boundaries of the Greeks and, and the, the Persians and, and the Egyptians, they would take prisoners of war, and a part of those prisoners of war duties would be, would be served, servitude. It was, it was also uh, a form of, of slavery was, was the children whose parents' lives were lost in those wars were now orphaned, and so the Roman Empire would bring them under kind of the, the provision of Rome through servitude. You could also, uh, if you owed a debt to somebody, you could willingly step into servitude and, and again, wrong in, in all forms, but some parents, rather than entering into that servitude themselves, would, would offer their children as, as a servant for uh, a payment of the debt that was owed. Depending on which historian you read, uh, you would see a suggestion between 10 to 40% of the Roman Empire were slaves in the Roman Empire. So if you just took kind of the middle of that, that roughly 25% of Rome was slaves. A good number of the slaves actually were educated and they held positions of influence and some would even hold influence within the Roman government. In general, historians would write about the Greeks and the Egyptians that they were more educated and in general, they would write about the Europeans that they tended to be stronger. 
And so this would lead slaves uh, to holding a, a number of different positions within the household. Some would serve as tutors, some would serve as carpenters, some uh, would even serve as architects and doctors, and, and as I noted before, some would even be involved in politics. And, and while there are different theories on this, I, I, I bring this up just to help us understand that this is within the scope of, of possibility and reason within kind of the, the Roman Empire. Some suggest that Luke, the physician, the doctor, and the one who was born a Gentile, um, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, and the one who wrote the book of Acts, that some suggest that he possibly was a slave. And one of the theories around kind of the mysterious name Theophilus in the book of Acts, I don't subscribe to this, but it's just, it's, it, it's a helpful kind of side note to think through what it looked like in, in the, the ancient world. Some suggest that Theophilus could have been the master of Luke. This, this is the social and the cultural norm in, in which the early Christian operated, and Paul is speaking into those norms, and he's disrupting them as he skillfully applies the gospel, not with a heavy hand, but with a heavy heart. So I want to encourage you to follow along as we read the book of Philemon together. We're going to read the entirety of the book this week and next week, and this week we're going to focus on this idea of equality and identity. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church that is in your house. So Paul sees Philemon as a beloved uh, fellow worker, and uh, many people, most people believe that Aphia, our, the sister that's being addressed here, is Philemon's wife, and, and that Archippus is, is the son. So it's, it's to your household, Philemon, and, and in your household, you have you have hosted the church in Colossae. Last week, we saw in Colossians that Nympha hosted the church in Laodicea. It's, it's common for a home to host the church, and Philemon hosts the church in his house. Paul says, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of your faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the heart of the saints have been refreshed through you. And so we see this introduction speak to Philemon as a beloved fellow worker, as one who's hosting the church within his home, as, as one who has a love for the saints, and his love for the saints is an encouragement to Paul's heart. Now, this, this is not unrelated or unimportant because what Paul's going to do is he's going to say, you love the saints, and I want to introduce you to one of the saints that should be loved within your church. You know him as a runaway slave, but I want to I reintroduce him to you through the lens of the gospel and through Christ. Here's a, another saint that I want you to love, Philemon, and his name's Onesimus. Verse 8, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required. I, I could lead with a heavy hand, but let me lead with a, with a heavy heart. For love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner, also for Christ. Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. He's, Onesimus, uh, the name meaning actually means useful. And so Paul is using his name to, to speak to the, the gospel's effectual working in the life of Onesimus. Verse 12, I'm sending him back to you, and I'm sending with him my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be of compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was uh, parted from you for a while, that, he might ha that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's done any wrong to you at all, or he owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your own, you owing me your very self. 
Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And so prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Heavy heart, he presents Onesimus, the once slave turned to saint, the once harmful, now useful, the once run away and abandoned, now a child in the faith, a once bond servant. Now he presents him as a brother, and he says, and prepare a place for me because I'm coming, and I'm excited to hear how you receive Onesimus and the Lord. Verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, he also sends greetings. Just a side note, we believe Epaphras is the, the pastor of the church in Colossae, and so Paul just kind of siding Epaphras says, oh, and by the way, the man who has a spiritual authority and oversight over your life, he's also involved in these conversations, and, and he sends his greetings to you, and so does Mark and Aristarchus and Demas and Luke and my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and your spirit. Here's, here's the main thought this morning. Equality is not some arbitrary concept that is shifting with culture. It, it, it seems like this conversation, we, we can do one of three things with it. We can reject the idea of equality. We can receive it outright as culture has, has packaged it for us. Or, or we can find the redemptive, biblical, theological elements that are actually the source of of it. And equality is not something that's arbitrary and constantly shifting with culture, but rather it's rooted in a biblical understanding of identity. Our identity is, is what leads to a right understanding of equality. And because identity has been so profoundly distorted in our culture, we're trying to figure out some sort of, 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 of arbitrary boundary to, to figure out equality because we've totally undermined our identity. Here's what I would say to you. Our identity has a source, and therefore our identity is fixed. And if our identity is fixed, then our equality is sure. Identity has a source, and it's in the Imago Dei. Paul seemed to already have laid the foundation for this throughout the teaching of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, as Paul's speaking of kind of that, that, that beauty of Christ, he says, for by Christ and for Christ, all things have been created. And so, so Paul, even in, in his introduction to Colossians, is saying, you have an identity, and your identity comes from a source, and it's tied to that source that you bear the image of God. He would then, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, say, we put on a new self, so the gospel has not replaced our identity, but it's restored it. In our new self, we're now being renewed in knowledge after whom? The image of our Creator. And so our identity has a source, and, and that source is fixed, and we read about it in God's original design of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God made man in his image, you bear the imago Dei. Therefore, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your generation, regardless of your cognitive ability... Regardless of how much money you have in your bank account and your position at your workplace, you are a person who is to, to, to have dignity, value, and worth because you bear the image of God. For by him and for him all things have been created. He created man in his own image, the image of God. He created them, and he created them male and female. So each person created by God, for God, has the image of God imprinted on their life. And therefore, as the gospel comes to bear in the life of the Christian, we rightly perceive not just the source of our identity, but the value to be found and seen in each person. And this is why the Christian church has been at the center of the abolishment of slavery, rightfully so. For when we rightfully see people as image bearers of God, they cannot become our possession, for they already belong to one who is greater than us. There is no place in the paradigm of Christian faith for any form of slavery. And can I just take it a, a step further? There's no place within the Christian faith for a Christian to minimize the value of one life over another in any way for any reason. Why? Because our identity is sourced by the image of God that's imprinted in us, and our identity is what sources, rightfully sources, the equality that we should find around us. 
Paul understands this, and so his appeal is theological and biblical, and he looks to Philemon, rightfully so, and he says, here's a man who you once perceived this way, but let me now present him to you this way, as a brother, as a co-laborer, as one who's useful. And we've seen the way that this worked out through the Christian life as Christians have rightfully stood on biblical and theological convictions and the way that it shaped the culture around them. We saw it in the first century. We also saw uh, through the, the abolishment of, of slavery in more modern history. And let me just reference two people in, in which their faith rightfully shaped their perception of those who would be minimized and despised by culture. There's a man named John Sullivan Dwight who took a French poem. He was a Christian and he was an abolitionist and he took a French poem and he translates it into English. The song we sing every Christmas, O Holy Night. We love it. It's one of my favorite Christmas songs. And he took the third verse and he revised it to emphasize this value of our Christian faith. Here's what he wrote as he translated this French hymn. He says, truly he taught us, who? Jesus. He taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Check out these next verses. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. Obviously, like in mind of a Christian uh, abolitionist who wants to see slavery uh, rid within the Western world and Christian values remain, like he obviously has something in mind, but I I think there's probably two meanings in mind. Not only is the slave our our brother, but we we are akin to slavery, and so we should be mindful of, of our brother who also may be enslaved. And he goes on and he says, and in his name, the name of Jesus, all oppression, every oppression shall cease. Like he's just taking scripture and he's skillfully applying it to something that had been politicized so that the gospel might be advanced. It's not just John Sullivan Dwight who would translate the old hymn, O Holy Night, but John Newton, we, we referenced him last week. He was once a slave trader who converted to Christianity. Now, much of John Newton's involvement in the slave trade I I think if you read history, um, was certainly influenced and induced by circumstances. But even then, as he matured in his faith, he came to deeply regret his involvement. Strong sorrow latter latter in, in life as he reflected on his involvement in this diminishing and dehumanization of, of another people. And in 1787, Newton would write a tract entitled Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade, in which he would graphically describe the horrors of the slave trade and his personal role in it. And and as he reflected on his life, he, he would encourage other Christians to allow their values to shape the the world in which they lived. And there was a man named William Wilberforce, who was a politician. And and William Wilberforce wasn't sure how politics and and faith intersected. And he says, I'm just going to I'm going to leave the the political realm and I'm I'm going to go into to the ministry. And and what John Newton, knowing the influence of of legislation, he said, No, you need to stay in the place that God's providentially planted you, and you need to allow your values to to shape the world from the inside out. And so I would just encourage you in the same ways that John Newton encouraged William Wilberforce, like God has planted you in a place for your Christian values and your faith to shape the culture around you from the inside out so that we can rightfully, prayerfully see the the kingdom of God come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so William Wilberforce stayed in his position and saw the system change from the inside out. It's Newton who penned the lyrics, Amazing Grace, in which he would say, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. At the end of his life, as his memory was fading, it's said that he made a statement, Although my memory is fading, there are two things that I am very clear on. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. His headstone on his grave would eventually read, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel, libertine, a servant of slave in in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith that he had long labored 
to destroy. Francis Schaeffer helps us understand how important our faith is in bringing uh, form to our world in which freedom can rightfully flourish. Francis Schaeffer argues that without a theistic understanding of the world that's rightly offered through Christianity, a nation would devolve into licentiousness or arbitrary majority rule. Some sort of arbitrary rule and definition of of what identity is and and where it is that we discover equality or or it would devolve into licentiousness. Just do whatever you want, whatever feels right. It's as if Francis Schaeffer could could see the the outcome of humanism and naturalism and and an atheistic worldview and he would caution the generation that would follow of of the outcome of this and, and we now get to live in this and might I just encourage you, Paul too was living in a complex culture, but was skillfully uh, applying the gospel. And he speaks to an identity that Onesimus and Philemon have as people who would bear the image of God. Second thought about this is, is identity, uh, our identity has been defaced. I see broken image bearers throughout the world, but it has not, as, as one author would write, has not been erased. And I would go a step further that the gospel restores the image of God in man. It doesn't replace the image of God in man. And we've, we've come to, to realize this through our study in Colossians, that the gospel does a, a transformative work in us, and it's not, giving us, it's not giving us a different creation, it's giving us a new creation, or, or maybe a good way to understand it, a renewed creation. And when God made the world and he said it was good, and when he made man in his image, male and female, and he said it was good, he meant it was good. And and that image in man has been defaced, and it's been complicated, and culture doesn't know what to do with it. But scripture says through the gospel, we are restored unto God as a new creation. Not a different creation, but a new creation. And there are five primary terms that I introduced to our church or that that I spoke of uh, to our church when we were working through Colossians. And it seems appropriate to, to, to visit those again in light of this conversation of Paul presenting Onesimus as a brother in the Lord back to Philemon. These five terms are, are spoken of in, in John MacArthur's New Testament commentary, and the five terms are this, justification. What is justification? Justification is a sinner who stands before God as guilty and condemned, but he's declared righteous through the work of Jesus. Second theological term, redemption. This is the sinner who stands before God as a slave and is granted freedom by the payment of Christ third theological term in the New Testament to describe the gospel is forgiveness. The sinner stands before God as a debtor, and the debt has been paid through Christ and therefore forgotten. Fourth theological word to describe the gospel, adoption or sonship. This is the sinner standing before God as a stranger and now made a son. Fifth and final, reconciliation. This is the sinner standing before God as an enemy and now becoming a friend. You wonder why Paul had the audacity to take Onesimus, one who would be despised by culture, and send him back to Philemon as a new creation? It's these five theological terms. It's because Paul knew who he was apart from Christ and what he had received in Christ. You could could take this and you could say, man, justification, this is Onesimus standing before God as guilty and condemned, but through the work of Jesus now being declared righteous. And so I'm going to send Onesimus back to you, Philemon, not as one who's guilty or condemned, but one who's been made righteous through the blood of Jesus. I'm going to send Onesimus back to uh, you, Philemon, as a sinner who once stood before God as a slave enslaved to sin and and maybe once served you as as a bond servant but he's no longer a bond servant because he's been granted freedom through the blood of jesus i'm going to send onesimus back to you philemon as one who's been forgiven a sinner who once stood before god as one who was indebted maybe he's taken something from you and if he has i'll pay it back in full where did paul get that idea through the gospel through the work that jesus has done on his behalf. And so he, he presents Onesimus not just as a sinner who stood before God as a debtor, but as one who now stands at the foot of the cross, whose debt has been paid and forgiven and therefore forgotten. Mm. 
I'm going to send Onesimus back to you, Philemon, as a sinner who once stood before God as a stranger, but he's now a beloved brother, and receive him just as you would have received me. And I'm going to send Onesimus back to you, Philemon, as one who once stood before God as an enemy, running away from you, running away from God, one who carried the name of usefulness, and he was actually harmful to you by taking from your household. He may have been an enemy, but through Christ, he now becomes your friend. The gospel restoring what God designed, the image of God and the life of Onesimus actually having a source. And because it has a source, there's a security in what Paul's doing as he presents Onesimus back to Philemon. A security, something that's fixed, not something that's arbitrary based on the the majority rule because the majority rule of the ancient world, if I'm just being honest, it was wrong. And many times throughout history, the arbitrary rules that are majority ruled are oftentimes wrong. And and to be clear, Christians over history have at times found themselves on the wrong side of what's biblical and theologically right because the influence of culture has been so strong. And it's no different today, that if we're not thinking biblically and theologically about these things, the the voice of, of majority rule, it's arbitrary, it's not secure, it's elusive, it's a moving target, and yet we can find ourselves being influenced by it because the noise is is so loud. But Paul, one who's mature in in the faith, one who's grounded in the scriptures, one who saw the image of God in every man, he presents Onesimus not just as what culture would see him as, but he presents him as what God sees him as and calls Philemon to receive him through the lens that God sees Onesimus. Three, three kind of final thoughts on, on this, and then the worship team is going to come up and lead us in a portion of a song as we participate in Lord's Supper. First is this, the Christian's uniquely qualified to rightly engage a world of inequality with the message and the sourcing for true equality. Like this, this is a big topic. I, you know, to cover it in 35 minutes is tricky. Um, it's a big topic, but, but don't, don't let the complexity of the topic, don't, don't let the complexity of what does it look like to send Onesimus back to Philemon and, and see that thing work out. Like don't let the complexity prevent you from speaking with clarity. God has uniquely qualified you with the truth of Scripture to engage a world that's marked by inequality with a message and a sourcing for true equality. Second is, is this, and, and I just want to note because we're talking about identity, like you're not an accident. Who you are, what nation you're from, what generation you're a part of, what, what cognitive abilities, natural skills that God's imparted to you, not, it's not a mistake, it's not an accident. I share it this way often, you're created on purpose for a purpose, but, but it's good to note and remember that, that you bear the image of God, not, not because of your merit. Onesimus is not being presented back to Philemon. Like, look at the merit of Onesimus. Like, he's presenting Onesimus to Philemon as an image bearer of God, therefore one who's worthy of dignity, value, and worth your life has value, your life has worth, not because necessarily your merit, but simply because you bear the image of a mighty and a holy and a glorious God. And the third and and the final thought that I have that I hope you consider is that, that our faith in Jesus does not prohibit you from finding your true self. But in Jesus, we find the means for finding our true self as our true self is restored by him and for him. I invite the worship team to come up and they're going to lead us in a portion of a song and I'll lead us in the Lord's Supper. This table reminds us that in Christ uh, we are a new creation. We are a renewed, if I could use that language, a renewed creation. That in Christ we have been reconciled to our creator and, and we find everything that we need in Jesus to be seated at the table of the almighty, holy, most high God. Not coming as a, as a stranger, not coming as an uh, as, as, as a, a, a outside guest, but coming, coming as, as family, 
And so for the Christian uh, here this morning, uh, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus alone as your Lord and Savior, this table is for you to remind you of the means by which your life has been ransomed and reconciled and forgiven, the means by which you've been adopted and, and justified, the means by which you can come to a holy and almighty God as, as Father, and, and the means is the sufficiency of Christ on the cross. If you're here with us this morning and, and you're exploring uh, this message of faith and, and exposing yourself to the values of Christianity, we're really glad uh, you're here. Uh, we don't think it's on accident, by accident, that you stumbled into our doors uh, this morning. Uh, we believe that you have a creator who cares about you, who loves you, who created you on purpose, and in Christ, you get to experience that purpose in full. That's why Paul could say in Ephesians chapter 2 that we once were dead in our sins and our trespasses, but God, who's rich in mercy, has made us alive in Jesus. And in Jesus, we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do a good work, uh, which he prepared in advance. And so I'd encourage you, rather than participate in this table, which is reserved for the Christian, just spend this time uh, really considering, could it, could it be that I have a creator and that that creator created me on purpose, for a purpose, and that that first step in fulfilling that purpose is through faith in his son Jesus. Let me pray for us, and then the worship team will lead us in a portion of the song, and I'll lead us in the Lord's Supper. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word gives us understanding and insight on um, how it is, why it is that we engage. Lord, we pray that we would think rightly and biblically and theologically about these things, knowing that our identity has a source, and that source is you, and therefore our identity is fixed in you as an image bearer of God. We are not an accident, but we were created on purpose for a purpose. And, and in Christ, there's a reclamation of the goodness of your design in our life. And so, Lord, we thank you as we come to this table for the work of Christ on our behalf, that through him we have been justified, declared righteous, that through him we have been adopted, that we have become your son and daughter, that through him we have been reconciled, that we are no longer an enemy, but we are a friend, that, that through him that there is a, a redemption, that we're no longer a slave, but we've been set free. That this table reminds us that one day when we stand before you, that you, our judge, will also become our justifier. Not based of, off, of, off of our merit, but based off of the su sufficiency and the completed work of Christ on the cross for us. And so we pray that you would use this table to remind us of Christ and the cross and the debt that was paid for our sin. Should we question the sufficiency of this debt that was paid by Christ, might our eyes turn from the cross to the empty tomb in which you raised Jesus from the dead, defeating sin, Satan, and death, and you set him at your right hand, interceding on our behalf. We thank you for this work, and we pray that you would use this time to remind us of the sufficiency of this work. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.